Right. And, and the cool thing about kinesiology tape, because it's tape applied to the skin, a lot of people have been asking the question, well, just like your shirt on your clothing or your clothing on your body, your brain will eventually accommodate, meaning that it, it recognizes the stimulus and then it eventually decreases the, the activation. But because this tape is elastic, it, it has a tendency to reactivate these mechanoreceptors through movement. So whenever you move your body part, the elastic quality of the tape combines with the movement to add another stimulus to these mechanoreceptors, which maintains that conversation to the brain is a term that I like to use. By stimulating these mechanoreceptors, we have an effect on different parts of the central nervous system and kinesiology tape is demonstrating a more robust effect over, over those three to five days that we're, we're, we're documenting the tape on the body. Welcome to the Undercurrent Podcast. I am joined today by Dr. Steve Capobianco, the co-founder of Rock Tape. And I'm excited to dive into the story of Rock Tape here. Uh, before we do that, we'll ask him a little bit about his career. He, he was practicing as a chiropractor mm -hmm. before co-founding Rock Tape and starting this, this movement within the industry. And uh, I'm just delighted to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I always like to talk shop, so I've known you for couple of months now. I think we've we met a couple of months ago and I think we're on the same page so I look forward to the conversation. Heck um, yeah. Heck yeah. As for you know, who I was pre rock <laughs> tape, um, I still practice now, nowhere near at the level I used to, but I've been practicing for almost 20 years now. And um, I started my practice in Northern California, uh, right out of chiropractic college in 2003 practiced there for about 12 to 13 years uh i met a guy uh, that i wish it was more involved in that that you know a guy showed up at my office he had uh, a roll of kinesiology tape um, that he had invented and he knew that i was the taping guy in in our small town so he wanted my opinion on it and at that time i was using a competitor's and I was having some difficulty with it uh, quality-wise, just wasn't doing what I was expecting with my patients. And he just showed up at the right time and he says, I, I think I have a better widget. And uh, I tried it out, I agreed with him, I called him back and I said, I, I have an idea of, of uh, a process of education for this product, which is different than what others have, have, uh, have taught over the last 30 years. And so we started the company together that way. So that was kind of the inception of Rock Tape, just a right time, right place, so to, so to speak. And, uh, and we were both aligned with kind of getting this product out into the market. And mm -hmm. my method was to use education to be able to do that. That's awesome. And before we dive into the education, because um, I'm really interested in, in sharing your perspective on that, mm -hmm. because... You know, it's, it's very interesting. There's a lot of overlap in the, the concepts that we cover on this podcast and in our curriculum. Um, before we do that, just, just to make sure everyone who's listening understands, for those who have not used kinesiology tape, yeah. can you just, just give a quick primer on what it is, you know, how it's different from like traditional yeah. you know, athletic trainers taping your ankle, just, just a little bit about what it is so everyone understands? Yeah, it's a good question. I think a lot of people have a misconception of this style, this category of tape. And I keep using the term kinesiology tape, but I could also use the term elastic therapeutic tape. And ultimately that just describes it better that it's tape that stretches versus the traditional um, form of tape that most of us are, most of us recognize is that uh, cotton athletic tape, rigid tape that's intended to support or protect an area of the body. Um, this tape has uh, elasticity within it that allows you to uh, go through the full range of motion that the joint or body area has. So that's one of the main differentiations of traditional tape. It's, it's elastic, so it's made out of cotton and nylon woven together with an acrylic-based glue that allows it to adhere to the skin for 
three to five days. That's the average of, of most kinesiology tape. Okay. So once it's applied, it's applied over a, an area that's experiencing pain, swelling, some type of movement dysfunction potentially to be able to uh, uh, affect the area. And we can talk more of what that's really doing, what we think it's doing and what the science is telling us, but to affect the area for multiple days versus traditional tape, again, is meant to be for a short period of time to again, protect and, and restrict range of motion. Awesome, so great description, thank you. I think everyone will understand the difference. This is the tape that you see, you know, the <laughs> volleyball athletes wearing at the Olympic, beach yeah. volleyball wearing at the Olympics and stuff. And so yeah. um, definitely different from athletic tape. And because of that elasticity, it has that property of being able to, to create, uh, you know, tension and, and pull that creates slack on the skin. And, yeah. and so there's mechanical and also neurological benefits. So can you, can you speak to, you know, what the tape actually does? Yeah, uh, I think you brought up something that was interesting first uh, is that the tape has been around for almost 40 some odd years now. And there was lots of misconception of what this elastic tape, this colorful elastic tape can really do to, uh, for, you know, for those that are looking for pain mitigation, swelling control and movement. Um, but it wasn't until the 2008 Olympics that Kerry Walsh, uh, the U.S. beach volleyball player, had it on her shoulder. And from my understanding, she'll be competing at the next Olympics, um, in the 2021 Olympics, uh, for her fifth uh, time, which is amazing, wow. to be wow. honest. Um, but she had tape on her shoulder, and it, it got a lot of question. It garnered a lot of question of what this tape was doing. And I, I think that's uh, been to a benefit for us in the Western world because we just got exposed to it at that time and, and really started um, a lot more research of what it's doing. So, so when, when you say we got exposed to it in the Western world, does that mean that of that 40 year history, it had started in the Eastern mm -hmm. world, it was used to be used more in, in Asian countries? Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So the, the founder of the, I guess the grandfather of this category tape is named Kenzo Kase, he was a chiropractor from Japan that created this, this category of tape and his category, uh, the brand that he created was Kinesio tape. And so that's considered, you know, the, the grandfather of the brand, of the category. Um, and uh, again, it was mostly used in Asia, but it now became more visible here in the Western world, the U.S. in particular, uh, because of Kerry Walsh. And it started to get a lot more questions about how it really works. And so that's what we really know now is because of the previous research over the last 10 years it kind of identified what it's doing to your point mechanically to the skin what it's doing because of its elastic quality and then what is it doing neurologically to be able to help with pain swelling and movement so so tell us what is it doing when it creates tension it creates that that you know you stretch it out and yeah. it creates that that tension kind of pulling the skin back in towards each other, the ends yeah. of the tape back in towards each other, what's actually happening there? Yeah, so uh, the, the, the tape, uh, once it's applied in a stretched position, either the body part or the tape or both, um, it, like any other elastic band, will recoil back to the center. And when it does so, it creates what, what we like to call the biomechanical lifting effect. And that just ultimately means it's lifting the skin away from the underlying tissue. So that's what we know is happening mechanically. So if you're, so if you're just listening to the audio and not watching the video, you see uh, Capo here, Dr. Capo Bianco, mm -hmm. sorry. That's I'm calling by his nickname. Yes. Uh, so uh, he's actually pinching his skin and pulling it up. So it looks like it, when we say tenting effect, it actually, you know, if you pinch the skin on your own arm and you lift it up, it looks like a little bit of a tent. Like it raises up kind of to a point and uh, it, it, you know, literally is lifted off the layers beneath it. So yeah. please continue. Yeah, so we've been able to document that uh, objectively using multiple mediums, but the, the most recent has been using MSK or musculoskeletal ultrasound. So you can actually document how much lift or tenting uh, is occurring from the skin uh, away from the underlying tissue. And we're able to document uh, from, you know, uh, 0.5 millimeters to two, three millimeters of space that's acquired underneath the skin. And so that, that for some could, could mean, you know, that's, that's creating more space for blood flow. That could be more space for lymphatic drainage, and all of those may or may not be true. We're getting more evidence as we as we're as we're uh, learning about this this type of product. But um, what the research has kind of pivoted 
is saying, well, if we're having a mechanical effect to the skin and underlying connective tissue, the next question from these researchers has been, what are we doing neurologically? What, how are we stimulating the receptors, the mechanoreceptors in that area? And that's what exciting for me is to be able to better understand what is happening neurologically locally, where the tape is applied to the skin, uh, and then what is happening centrally to the to the brain. So that's what we're starting to learn more of. And what the evidence is telling us, uh, at least right now, is that we are stimulating uh, multiple different categories of mechanoreceptors from uh, the light touch receptors of C-tactile fibers to Meissner's to Merkel discs to the Paxinii and even Ruffini's. Um, that exist in that area uh, within the skin, superficial uh, connective tissue or fascia, as well as the deep fascia. So you're stimulating all the receptors that sense light touch, deep touch, vibration, movement of the skin. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything. You're getting right. everything in there. Right. And, and the cool thing about kinesiology tape, because it's tape applied to the skin, a lot of people have been asking the question, well, just like your shirt on your clothing or your clothing on your body, your brain will eventually accommodate, meaning that it, it recognizes the stimulus and then it eventually decreases the, the activation. But because this tape is elastic, it, it has a tendency to reactivate these mechanoreceptors through movement. So whenever you move your body part, the elastic quality of the tape combines with the movement to add another stimulus to these mechanoreceptors, which maintains that conversation to the brain is a term that I like to use. By stimulating these mechanoreceptors, we have an effect on different parts of the central nervous system, and kinesiology tape is demonstrating a more robust effect over, over those three to five days that we're, we're, we're documenting the tape on the body. That's awesome. So when you when you first had the concept, you know, met your co-founder Greg mm -hmm. and uh, had this concept of of really leading with education, did you already have that neurological understanding of what the tape can do, or is that something that's evolved in those last ten years? Totally evolved. Okay. Uh, and and education of which it should it should always evolve. So my view of kinesiology tape at the time was was pretty rudimentary where I knew that it had a lifting effect because you could see the lifting effect from the outside and it had an effect on pain so I, I initially started thinking about you know the traditional gait model where I'm stimulating these fast traveling mechanoreceptors but I didn't know which ones and I, I figured that that was the mechanism just like you know general touch of you know human touch I felt that it was mimicking something like that but I just didn't necessarily understand it as well as I do now but uh, that's the beauty of, of the evolution of knowledge is that we've gained more and more understanding and better techniques to measure to be able to feed the information that I'm actually delivering in our education. So it's, it's just definitely evolved over the last 11 years since we started it. Mm -hmm. so just, to give, just to give people a scope of the education before we dive back into some of the you know, curriculum and content and concepts yeah. here, uh, how, many, how many people have you... Certified. I've been through at least one rock tape certification. Well, that's a good, that's a good question. I, <laughs> I should have prepped you for this. In I wasn't, I'm not sure if I'm prepared. <laughs> um, let, let's say that we started our education platform in 2010. Um, so it's obviously been 10, 11 years approximately. Uh, we uh, crested, you know, pre-COVID of about a thousand courses a year here domestically in the U.S., um, and then the traditional uh, number of people in our live courses is 25 uh, people. Um, so we're looking at you know 20 to 25 you know thousand people per year uh, have been trained. And so you know that that would be a ballpark number that I, we can give you. So I'm proud to say that we we train a lot of of therapists uh, from physical therapists to occupational therapists to chiropractors to massage therapy to personal trainers. Um, athletic trainers, uh, acupuncturists, and, and more. So that's kind of the category that we get to teach. So, so even if people are taking multiple courses, like we're into six figures of, in terms of number of people who have been through at least one rock tape certification. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. awesome. That's, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Uh, so in terms of the curriculum and, and what you actually cover in these courses, uh, just to kind of re recap and reflect back, we're hearing that we have this mechanical tenting effect, which helps tissues move better when the skin is pulled up. There's more ability for the skin to move over the superficial fascia and mm -hmm. the other layers of tissue underneath it. 
and we get this stimulation of these neurological uh, receptors. So we get more input into the central nervous system. That's a big theme in our curriculum is creating input into the nervous system in order to change the, the perception of threat, which yeah. plays into pain and, and plays into the, the degree to which the nervous system will either inhibit or allow performance of the body. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think what you're tapping into is, you know, is important. And obviously you see that in the results that it happens. So can you just kind of complete that, that loop, you know, in terms of what, what your kind of, what your message is when you're teaching courses or when your, your team of other instructors are teaching these courses, Mm -hmm. you, you create this input and then you're activating these receptors and then what, you know, what are you seeing? What's kind of the next phase of that and how you describe it? Yeah. Um, I I like the way that you kind of summed it up, but it's exactly what we try to deliver is this is providing some type of input and the input that, or at least the term that we're using to be able to communicate the type of input is this novel stimulus, this, Mm -hmm. this stimulus that the brain uh, deems novel or deems interesting. Um, and that's, that's something that I think is unique to this type of tape is that it, because it's elastic and because it continues to provide that, that stimulus, that safe and novel stimulus, the brain pays attention. And so, um, so what we try to do, uh, what we try to clarify in our education is that it's a novel, safe stimulus that we're providing to an area that is under threat, the meaning that the the brain is interpreting that that area is under threat and it may be uh, increasing the perception of pain that person's experiencing due to that fact. So to provide a safe stimulus that could potentially mitigate that threat and, and improve the perception of pain, now we quickly couple that with some type of movement. We want to take that opportunity where we decrease the threat signal, if you will, uh, and then encourage what I call meaningful movement. If that person is coming to you, let's take any patient or client that's coming in with, let's say, elbow pain, that's taking them away from swinging a golf club that they love to do at their men's club every Thursday. Um, By providing a stimulus to that region of the body, that mechanical stimulus that we just described, that provides that safe neurological stimulus, potentially that as it's as it's perceived by the brain, can decrease the threat, improve their their pain perception, which allows them to move through that range of motion more comfortably, which starts to build that this other component of the experience, which is uh, safety and and confidence and hope. There's other components of the of the equation when it comes to someone in, in pain that we need to understand, and that's what we've again, evolved into our educational offering is that it's more than just a strip of tape. It's how you use that strip of tape uh, with the individual that you're working with. And I think that's the part that I'm most proud of when it comes to our education is that the, the tape isn't the, isn't the tool. It's, it's the experience that you provide with that tool. And that's what, what we try to uh, provide our attendees at our courses. I love that. There's a lot of wisdom in there. And ultimately, when, you know, if, if you're a clinician treating somebody, you have a few different tools and you have yourself and how you interact and how you make that person feel. And that all factors into those are all variables that influence how that patient is going to respond to treatment. So I I love that you take that, you know, more, I guess you'd call it holistic view of treatment because it's all relevant. It's not just like, Woo, woo woo I mean we know neurologically that how you interact with how your clinician interacts with the patient and um, how we the language that we use and their understanding of why they think they have pain mm-hmm. that all factors into their outcomes so I, yeah. I love that you're covering that yeah and I think you know when it comes to the nervous system I, I think we we have the tendency of of isolating ourselves that you know neurologically it's a mechanoreception to a specific part of the brain and that is the only interaction but we know that the brain is influenced uh, not only uh, neurologically or biologically but it's also influenced psychosocially mm-hmm. and that's the part that I'm talking about is that the the effectiveness of a of a product or a tool like kinesiology tape can't be relegated only to that neurological you know mm-hmm. window it's 
the, the opportunity that it provides psychosocially to be able to build all those other components of the pain experience. So one interesting tidbit that I've heard you speak about before, and I'm, I'll ask you to share here is, uh, can you talk to that, that uh, psychosocial interpretation of hair follicle stimulation? That mm. was a really interesting tidbit. Yeah. Um, so again, I, I, something that I would never have considered <laughs> when I first started this, this company and started the educational platform is because I didn't know. Uh, that the hair follicles that we have, you know, on the majority of our body, less, you know, the palms of our hand and, and, our, and the soles of our feet and some portions of, of many people's face, is that the majority of our body is covered by hair. And I didn't really understand the significance of the hair follicle or the nerve root plexus that, that envelops every single hair that we have in our body and how it's... Uh, it's uh, ending the nerve ending that that innervates those hair follicles goes to a different part of the brain um, and the part of the brain that we're starting to get a better understanding of is this uh, region of the brain called the affective affective uh, region of the brain that includes parts of the brain called the insula the anterior anterior cingulate uh, the periaqueductal gray is also a component of the affective region of the brain and this is the part of the brain that's involved with uh, the uh, the perception and anticipation of pain, um, the emotional context around the pain experience, uh, and other components of affect. Um, and the interesting thing about uh, deflecting or bending a hair follicle or plucking a hair follicle stimulates these receptors called C tactile fibers. And these uh, C tactile fibers um, preferentially stimulate this affective region of the brain that is demonstrating uh, potential. If, again, if that stimulus is safe and novel, it will provide a safe and novel stimulus to that region of the brain that could potentially feed it to mitigate the, the threat associated with the stimulus mm -hmm. and, or, the, or the threat of the associated area that's being innervated. And I'm not sure if that explained it well enough, but the cool thing is, is that you stimulate these C tactile fibers that exist within the hair follicle. Um, they can preferentially stimulate a part of the brain that is associated with the emotional context of pain. Mm -hmm. That's that's awesome. It's it's powerful stuff. And yeah. Some, you know, there's so many cases, and and you know, we've talked about it a little bit on this podcast for the clinicians who have been through our curriculum. We talk about how so many patients think, oh, this hurts, therefore something is broken, or I need <laughs> surgery, or I need a brace, or it's not going to feel better till it heals. And yet, you know, it it will heal. Whatever the injury is, will heal yeah. six, eight, ten, twelve weeks later, and they and they still have pain, and they have pain for months or years, and. You know, we need to understand yeah. this model of pain that you're describing. It's so important and it's so empowering for patients if they can understand like, you know, there's it, pain doesn't mean I'm broken. Pain is my brain's interpretation of based on its its orientation towards survival, its, its evaluation of all these different threats in my environment. Pain mm -hmm. is my brain's way of telling me something's wrong. Yeah. But I can get to that through many different avenues sometimes. And this is, it's, it's, I love hearing you talk about it because it, it speaks to the potential of these different avenues and different ways that we can affect pain. For sure. And I think it's one of the n newest things. Again, not well enough um, delivered in the educational arena to be able to let therapists and movement specialists really understand the, the, this network of receptors that we have access to through touch. Um, to be able to influence someone's pain experience. So I think we're, we're moving into a, a direction that I'm really thinking is going to be effective. That's awesome. So one rock tape methodology question. So out, you know, outside of our conversations that we've had, how do you teach? What's your way to teach? What, you know, how to identify where that threat is or where to put the tape? 
Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the, the way that we identified is, is going to be the consistent with what most therapists usually use. They're going to use, you know, the, the typical history of getting that subjective analysis from the individual. Where is, where, where, where are you feeling this, the symptoms? And so that, that's going to be an important component of the, the total experiences we just discussed because I want to be able to apply the, the safe and novel stimulus to the area that that person's identified. Mm-hmm. Um, and that starts that therapeutic alliance between the therapist and the patient or client. So that's one way is obviously a subjective, you know, where is your pain? Uh, the second one would be going through the traditional orthopedic, you know, screen and testing to be able to identify what tissues need to be innervated or what areas of the body need to be innervated. So that could be either areas that are inhibited or where there's excessive tension that needs more, you need more mobilization. You you would tape, you know, both the quote unquote tight or weak tissues. Correct. And so yeah, to your point is that part of the ortho exam could be muscle testing. It could be, you know, neurological testing of, of two point discrimination, um, uh, vibration testing, all the traditional, you know, neurological tests that you have. Uh, in fact, we, we kind of lean pretty heavily on two-point discrimination to be able to identify, uh, I guess, uh, blind spots in, in Can, can, in you, the can you give the little overview on, on mm-hmm. what it is and how you implement it and why you'd want to work on yeah, places so, that so have a deficit? Ne- neurologically, as part of that part of the assessment or screen, you're using a device called a two-point discrimination tool, and they're, they're very readily in the, in the medical space, but you can literally purchase a two-point discrimination tool on Amazon. Um, they're inexpensive, but they're ultimately just, you know, two points that you would touch the skin and you're looking to ascertain the individual's ability to identify two points of contact of, uh, of that tool on the skin. And when an individual has difficulty identifying those two points, it gives us a, an idea of the clarity of their body map in a certain part of the brain called the somatosensory cortex. Um, And so we use two-point discrimination to identify the clarity of that body map, um, to be able to identify if someone has an understanding of where a body part is in space. And so that's one of the ways that we would use two-point discrimination to identify the area that we wanna provide a stimulus to be able to start to clarify the, uh, the resolution of that map, if you will. That's Does that awesome. make sense? That's awesome. Okay. And so for everyone who's, who's been through our curriculum, you know, we talk a lot about proprioception. If there's a deficit in proprioception in an area, it's like you're walking around in a room with your eyes closed. Yeah. You know, the brain can't see where the body is in space, and so it can't predict what obstacle it might run into or trip over. And so it, the brain causes the body to, to tighten up, mm-hmm. to move less, to protect, to be more guarded. Yep. And... Um, so being able to pick up that two-point discrimination and have a tool to apply tape like that is is awesome. Um, and all of that, you know, since we've started using rock tape here in our in our clinic in Austin, I mean, we've seen really cool benefits. And one of the things that, that I love is, like you said, that you're able to continue to get some stimulus for three days post-treatment as opposed yeah. to just having that stimulus kind of stop when the patient leaves the office. Yeah. Um, and so we've seen benefit all working on all the places that – you've described. And then also, uh, we'll add tape on the, the hot spots that we find when we go through our mapping process yeah. with the newbie, because those also are areas of elevated threat. So we've seen that that's, that's the only, I mean, obviously you have a wonderful curriculum and everything. That's the little, that's, I think the little piece that we've been able to kind of tweak. So, uh, and it, I think, you know, it adds a little something at least, you know, for, for us and our clinicians, it seems like, like being able to tape, the, have those as additional locations to tape or to prioritize you know, have been really cool there. Um, but I love hearing your description of all that. And it's really a wonderful curriculum they've put together. Thank you. Um, in order to, in order to kind of see it in action, what are, what are some of your top success stories that you'll share? If someone's like, you know, what, what can tape really do for me? What are the top, you know, couple examples that come to mind for you? Yeah. The, the, and this is not just using antidote. Um, I'm using what the evidence is telling us as well is that there are multiple systematic reviews, you know, top yeah. tier research that are indicating that, that kinesiology tape as a general rule is, 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 um, uh, either favorable, um, ideal or even recommended, um, and the, the areas that I would probably highlight in that category would be 
uh, plantar fasciitis or you know sole of the foot pain, uh, acute lower back pain, uh, chronic lower back pain, um, wrist pain, wrist and thumb pain, um, and patellofemoral or knee osteoarthritis. Um, those are the kind of main areas that have demonstrated for well over 10 years through pretty robust uh, testing that those are the most consistent areas that are demonstrating really good outcomes. Uh, that being said, I, could, I can share you know, 15, 20 years of, of taping patients um, anecdotally demonstrating effects on shoulder um, impingement syndromes, um, again, acute, acute and, lower, and chronic lower back pain. The one that I've, I've really been um, fortunate to work with is uh, pregnancy-related lower back pain, mm. which is a really difficult one because generally um, women going through late-stage pregnancy are, are relegated to, you know, sucking it up ultimately yeah, we, because... We can't even really use our machine. Exactly. We do other exercise or manual stuff. Exactly. Like They're typically contraindicated for many therapies. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, new moms are just begging for some relief and we're finding, and now the evidence is supporting this, that pregnancy-related lower back pain can be ameliorated mm. with the use of kinesiology tape. So that's a, that's a feel-good one for me, uh, that's at awesome. least. Um, so those are the kind of the general ones. Y you'll find quite often um, people are using them for pain, as I, as I just described, uh, you know, the areas uh, of the body that experience pain. But the kinesiology tape has also been uh, reported to benefit uh, swelling, both acute and chronic swelling. So you'll see this quite often used in ankle inversion sprains or sprained ankles and other forms of acute um, swelling and then even chronic swelling. And so again, this is, would be another one that I'm uh, just most thankful for to be able to help are specifically women, but it, breast cancer affects both men and women, but, but predominantly more women. And the women that have had the uh, radical mastectomies where they've removed lymph nodes in their axilla or their armpit, they quite often develop this chronic edema or swelling of their upper extremity, and it's, it's debilitating. And, and generally, those people are offered um, lymphatic massage therapy and or compressive sleeves to be able to mitigate that swelling, and both are uncomfortable, so the compliancy is pretty poor. So they found, over again, years of research, that kinesiology tape applied in a specific way to can... Uh, more comfortably manage their swelling and allow the individual to resume more normal daily activities of, of living. So that's a that's another feel good one that we're using tape for something that I would have I've never thought of, but it's helping people live a more productive life. That's awesome. That's, yeah. that's fabulous to really be able to make an impact for people who are sure. going through those those types of challenges. I mean, pregnant women and you know women who have been through breast cancer surgery it's oftentimes are you know kind of left behind yes. you know, by the system yes uh that's awesome that's yeah. really cool uh, so we've we've talked a lot about tape uh rock tape however has additional products can you just speak for a moment about some of the other products that you use and they all from what i can tell all fit into the same neurological framework so can you speak yeah. to other products and, and kind of how you use them just at a high level yeah the we we've been fortunate enough obviously the company is called rock tape <laughs> so we're probably best known for our kinesiology tape um, brand but uh, over the first couple of years of our um, development uh, i just i wanted us to be more of a movement-based company where we would provide products and education to be able to help people move more effectively. And tape fit that mold very well, but we had the opportunity to start creating and innovating on some other products. So the other uh, products in our toolkit, if you will, uh, would be uh, instrument-assisted soft tissue manipulation tools or IASTM um, tools. These are the stainless steel tools that many people use in the market already. We just made our version of these tools that we think are just, if not more effective. Uh, and we created an education platform around that. Uh, we have other soft tissue uh, manipulation tools, uh, our version of uh, traditional cupping therapy or decompression therapy, uh, as well as compression therapy, or we're using uh, a latex rubber band to wrap an area with compression and shear to be able to influence pain, swelling, and movement. 
And with, with all these, you're, you're, when you're teaching these at your certification, again, it's through that neurological mm-hmm. lens. You're talking about the receptors and the effect yeah. on the nervous system and brain. Yeah, I that. think the reason is, is traditionally, and this goes all the way back to Tate, but traditionally, most manual therapies, uh, they're taught with a mechanical lens, meaning that we're affecting this tissue, we're breaking down the fascia, we're disrupting the scar tissue or breaking up the, the scar tissue. And the evidence is heavily leaning towards the, the side suggesting that we're probably not doing what we think we are mechanically. And so now we're starting to get a better understanding because of better testing that these types of manual therapies are affecting the individual neuropsychosocially. That's again, going back. And so that's kind of our delivery of the message is Yes, we are mechanically influencing the tissue, but but more importantly, this is what's happening neurologically that's probably providing the output or the outcome that you're all observing. That's awesome. Yeah. For for any clinicians who have the newbie out there, I can tell you that we've used and many actually already do use yeah. rock tape tape and other other products. Mm-hmm. And I'll say that we've found that they work very well within this same model. We're all, we're all speaking the same language here about right. how can we provide the right inputs into the nervous system to reduce the perception of threat, to reduce the, the protective responses that limit performance, that, that keep the body locked in cycles of pain or dysfunction, and that delay the healing process you know, after injury. So mm-hmm. uh, I think that everything that you're describing, all your products work really well in combination with, with our concepts and with the newbie. So, I'm delighted that you were able to come on the show and, and share this. My pleasure. Uh, can you just, for everyone listening, can you talk a little bit about your experience with the newbie? Yeah. Um, well, just from your point, uh, I got introduced to you by a mutual friend, um, uh, Joe Dye, um, and uh, Joe said we had to meet because you know our message, uh, as it as it pertains to our specific therapeutic interventions, was similar. And at that time, interesting enough, I was experiencing a shoulder complaint, post-surgical reconstruction, and I was having some neurological symptoms that that I wasn't able to manage with my traditional toolkit, which is all the tools that I just referenced. Um, So to your point, the synergistic combination of, of interventions for some, including myself, could be the answer. And so I, I, wasn't planning on this when I initially met you, um, but when I came here and you explained the technology that you have, uh, you were thankfully um, uh, able to give me some experience of it, and it made a dramatic change in not not acute symptoms. I was having these neurological numbness and tingling symptoms uh, in my distal extremities, my hands in particular, for weeks if not months prior to meeting you so uh, i had attempted to intervene i wasn't effective but the combination of the newbie therapy and uh, and my my home care uh, seemed to get me through within what was it three or four treatments at best yeah and, over about two weeks or so. yeah it wasn't very long so i'm very thankful for the opportunity to be able to learn more about the technology personally uh, which has made a big difference. Awesome. I'm so glad you moved to Austin. <laughs> yeah, so am I. So am I. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Well, if anyone wants to learn about about your work, Rock Tape, I mean, what's the best place? Is it, you know, find you on Instagram, go to the Rock Tape website? Like, what's the best place to, well, to follow up and, and find more information? Well, uh, the right answer is to go to the website, <laughs> rocktape.com. Um, but as many of the viewers and listeners to this, that you know, many people go to social and try to find. We do have a social, a social entity uh, on all the platforms. Uh, me personally, I'm kind of identified, I guess self-identified, I put my name myself, uh, the fascia doc. And uh, the reason that I name myself that is that I'm very intrigued in this layer of connective tissue that I've been referencing just underneath the skin, uh, which which is generally identified as fascia. Um, And this network of tissue is another medium, if you will, to talk to the brain. And we're learning more and more about it over the last decade, and I've just been diving deep into it. And so that handle, fascia doc, allows me the opportunity to kind of share, you know, my viewpoint of what the research is telling us, what we're learning, you know, therapeutically in, in clinics, 
Um, so that's what I share on that platform. And, and platform. some funny memes. Yeah, well, that, that's the secondary <laughs> part of my... I, I, I want to educate you on what I'm learning about fascia, and I want to make you giggle. And that's, that's, that's it my works. story. You've gotten me to giggle from time to time. Great, on good, there. Yeah, it's good. good. So, and the, so people, when people find you, they'll see the pig. They'll Tell typically see the, the pig. The pig. What's the little pig picture? Gosh, right? sometimes I regret even calling it uh, or you know, using this as a handle. But there's a, a statement that's used. It's called "Be the pig," uh, and I've been using it for quite some time because it, it resonates. It resonated with me when I first learned about what this expression meant. Well, "Be the pig" uh, is referencing if you had a plate of bacon and eggs, uh, a, pre- a breakfast, a traditional breakfast plate. Of bacon and eggs um, what it's referencing is, is that the chicken as it relates to making that meal was just involved in laying the eggs but the pig was totally committed uh, and that might be gruesome for some people to hear <laughs> but but what be the pig signifies is that be committed to everything that you do so when I tell someone be the pig I want them to be committed as committed as I am to helping people move well, you've gone all in on the rock tape education, and, yes. and you've made a massive impact. Thanks for coming on and, and sharing some of it. And uh, for everyone listening, I can't say enough about about Capo here and the work that he's done and the quality of their products and education. And it's so complimentary to what we're doing that I'm just uh, you know really excited to be able to have you on the show and to be able to to use your stuff here Great. alongside the newbie. Great. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. All right. And thanks everybody for tuning in to this episode of the Undercurrent Podcast.